Um, my name is Torsten Grabs. I'm a program manager up in Redmond in the SQL Server team. And uh, what I want to do today is uh, get started with actually a couple of talks about Stream Insight that we are uh, that we are presenting throughout this last day of PVC. And the first one uh, is going to be an overview, a level 200 talk that just um, should introduce you into uh, Stream Insight, the value proposition, um, give you some idea about the use cases and the scenarios that we are targeting Stream Insight for. Then later today at 3 o'clock, um, Roman, who's sitting in the back, has a level 400 presentation that does a deep dive into the technology. And you'll see lots of code and lots of demos in, uh, in Roman's presentation as well. So let me get started with uh, the overview. And uh, let me first uh, motivate um, our, our approach and our decision and uh, give you some background and history um, around Stream Insight. So first of all, Stream Insight is uh, a product that's developed by the SQL Server organization in Microsoft. Um, we started this whole effort uh, about four or five years ago out of Microsoft Research um, when the interest in uh, stream data processing started in the academic community. And we went through a couple of steps after that through incubation. And finally, uh, we funded a product unit for it um, that's, that's productizing um, that fundamental work that came out of uh, Microsoft Research because of, uh, of the customer feedback and the customer requirements that we have seen in the MIUI. So what are those custom requirements? What are those, uh, what are those scenarios that led us to the conclusion to actually build a new product within the SQL Server flight of products to deal with new scenarios, specific scenarios? Um, having said that we are coming from the SQL Server organization, we feel very comfortable and we are very familiar with typical relational database applications. And uh, most of you probably know how they work. Um, you acquire the data, you put the data at rest uh, somewhere in the database on disk, and then you can do the processing over the data. You uh, run the transactions, you run your reports, you run your queries. And that's the typical way that relational database applications interact with the data. It's a request response scheme. Um, now, when we were starting to look into uh, the Stream Insight space, we actually discovered that there's a number of interesting and very compelling scenarios that have a completely different way how they want to interact with the data. And we typically see this in the context where you have a number of different data sources or sensors spread out that are constantly emitting data that you want to process. Now, the querying paradigm that you have for these kind of scenarios is very different from the one that we see for relational database applications. The query paradigm for those scenarios uh, and those applications, which we call event-driven applications, is a continuous querying paradigm. You fire up the query once, and you have the query standing, sitting around, and constantly processing the incoming data. So imagine having a sensor somewhere out there that is constantly giving you information about the temperature um, for a piece of equipment, and you want to monitor whether that temperature exceeds a certain threshold for that piece of equipment. So you want to have a query that's constantly consuming the incoming data and constantly checking that data against the threshold for that piece of equipment. And that's the, that's the different querying paradigm that we see for those event-driven applications. We, and we call those queries continuous uh, standing queries. Now, if you also think about two other key dimensions uh, around performance that we see for relational database systems, they're typically response time and throughput. And I tried to capture them on this slide here. Um, the response time requirements very much depend on the application that you're building for relational database system. For a transactional system, it might be a fraction of, you, of a second that you expect in terms of response time. For other scenarios, it might take hours or even days for long-running reports to complete. So that's the response time. If you think about uh, throughput, the typical or high, high rates of throughput that we see is hundreds, if not thousands, of transactions that, that need to get processed by the database application and the database system. Now let's switch over into the event-driven applications. What are the, what are the corresponding concepts to response time and throughput? We call them latency and data rate. The latency describes um, the, 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 the period of time that it takes from a new piece of data to arrive at the system for processing until you see the effect, the result of that new piece of data after it has arrived at the system. So that's the processing latency that's getting induced by the querying, by the processing that you do over the incoming data. And depending on the scenario, you may have very, very strict uh, latency requirements. For instance, in financial services, you want to react within a couple of milliseconds after you have received a stock ticker uh, piece of data from, from a stock exchange. 
Also, the data rates can be, can be very, very, uh, very, very demanding. So um, if you think, again, about financial services and acquiring feeds from stock exchanges, um, if you're just looking at stocks, you easily get into the order of tens of thousands of events uh, that you need to process. If you also include options or futures or derivatives into those feeds, then we are talking about hundreds of thousands of data items that need to be processed per second. Now, looking at that picture and, and, and kind of establishing that distinction between database applications and event-driven applications, that led us to the conclusion to actually think about the event-driven application space as an opportunity for a new, uh, for a new platform, for a new product. And uh, it's within the SQL Server organization, it's, it's within Microsoft's data platform because all the scenarios evolve in some way or another about processing data. So let's take the, uh, the, the, the latency dimension and the data rate dimension. If our world just has these two dimensions, how can we plot different use cases and scenarios in that space? And you see that in the upper left uh, corner, I have the relational database applications, and they cover a large, large area, and they cover it very, 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 very well. Now, if you exceed the data rate requirements or latency requirements and you go beyond a certain point, then databases uh, are starting to struggle as a platform to deliver compelling characteristics. And that space is what we want to cover with uh, Microsoft Stream Insight, and which is typically covered with products that go under terminology like CEP, complex event processing. So you can think of Stream Insight as a platform to do complex event processing and to build complex event processing applications. Let's look into some of those scenarios um, with a little a bit more detail. And somewhat randomly, I picked these four, manufacturing, web analytics, financial services, and power and utilities. So if you look at manufacturing, we're already looking at an example previously where you have a piece of equipment, you want to monitor the piece of equipment. In order to do that, you instrument it first. You, uh, you put a couple of sensors on that piece of equipment on the asset. And these sensors are gen generating a constant stream of data that give you information about the flow, pressure, temperature that you're running that piece of equipment with. And depending on that, you want to react very quickly when you see that some of those values, some of these measurements, go beyond the specified boundaries that you want to operate the piece of equipment in. Um, another way to instrument it is to keep track of quality for the product that's going to uh, your plant, for instance. And uh, you want to track and make sure that the quality of the product is as expected um, at all times. And if not, you want to react in some way. So that's the manufacturing space. Data rates, depending on the size of the plant and how well you've instrumented it, can already be very challenging. Another important scenario uh, that we want uh, to target with uh, Stream Insight are web analytics. The, uh, the scenario behind web analytics is that you have, um, that you have a cluster of web servers, and they're delivering, uh, they're delivering web pages to, uh, to customers that are browsing your online properties. You instrument those web servers such that for each click that a user makes, for each search query that a user submits, you are sending out an event to, uh, to, a, to a, an, a complex event processing engine to do all sorts of things. The, the most prominent one is you want to better understand the behavior of your online customers and quickly react to the behavior that you're observing. Um, the reaction can be that I pick a specific ad that is related to the behavior that I have observed. It can go all the way to adjusting the, the navigational structure of the online property so that the user finds the information that he or she is looking for more quickly. We are actually uh, working with an internal team at Microsoft that works with MSN.com, and they are using pre-release bits from Stream Insight to do exactly this for all of Microsoft's online properties. So we are receiving half a billion events per day. We are processing them, and what we are doing with it is we are doing customer segmentation. Um, the MSN team has predefined customer segments, and we want to find out in close to real time what customer segment does a current online user belong to? And based on that, we are driving content delivery, particularly ads. Um, the, important, the important characteristic here is that this is happening with very low latency. The whole pipeline, the whole round trip takes a couple of seconds. Previously, we were persisting all that information to disk, and it took the teams two to three days to come up with the customer segmentation information. And that precluded certain uh, scenarios for them. Now we have taken that down to a couple of seconds, so you can react actually within a, within a browsing session and deliver the appropriate content. We were already talking about financial services, which is another scenario. Here you're acquiring news and, and, and ticker uh, feeds from stock exchanges or from uh, providers such as Bloomberg or Reuters. And uh, the typical scenarios are risk management, market monitoring, or algorithmic trading. 
And uh, the, we were already, already, uh, already mentioned um, latency. What you want to make sure is the late, that the latency with which the system reacts allows you to, uh, to utilize that window of opportunity where you get a snapshot of the market and you have to react in. Another scenario here is power utilities where you have all sorts of instrumentation across the topology of your power grid. Um, substations, head-end systems are instrumented and give you information about their state. Power consumers may have power meters that tell you how much power they are consuming and what different appliances they are running. That can be used to uh, balance the grid, uh, can be used to adjust prices across your, your, your utility. And again, depending on how well you have instrumented it, how, how many of the households are generating information for you, the data rates can be very demanding. So what is the, uh, the overall infrastructure that we are looking at in order to enable these scenarios? And uh, at a very high level, there's a couple of components that I want to quickly mention. The first one is that, and we see this in many cases, is that you want to persist some sort of history about the pieces, uh, about the, uh, the data that you acquire. That gives you the ability to look at history for the pieces of equipment or your assets. In addition to that, you are running an event processing engine. And in, in that event processing engine, you are managing your current operations. And that can be as simple as checking for particular thresholds based on the data that you acquire from your assets. Can be more complex that you correlate multiple of those data feeds together or check for certain patterns. An additional piece that we see in, in a lot of scenarios um, is reference data, more static data that you want to correlate with the incoming real-time data. Typically, that data is held in a relational database system, and there's some sort of lookup going on that correlates the incoming real-time data feeds with the more static reference data. Once we have put all these pieces uh, together, we can start utilizing that for managing the, our business operations. And we already talked about those couple of examples here in the slide. Simple stuff like just plotting trend lines and checking against thresholds, um, or more complex ones where you have uh, clustering that's going on where you check for customer segmentation, or uh, pre uh, pre uh, proactive condition-based maintenance where you're plotting a trend line and you are looking at when is a particular uh, piece of equipment reaching a point where you have to maintain it. So if you take a step back, what, what, is a, what is a typical process that is being established over these pieces and components? I already mentioned that in a lot of cases, you want to persist some history about the data that you acquire. Why is that important? It is important because it gives you the ability to identify interesting patterns that may give you indication of how can I run my, my operations? What's the most efficient, the most cost-effective way to run a particular piece of equipment? And you identify this over your data history, over an archive that you have built. Once you have identified those patterns, those rules, those queries, you take them and you deploy them into, uh, into your event processing engine that allows you to manage your current operation. That's the second step that you see on the slide. The third step then is that you do this in an iterative fashion. You keep track of how well you're using those patterns and rules, and once in a while you go and check whether they, are, whether they still apply or whether there's an opportunity to refine them in one way or another. And that's a very powerful cycle. If you go and iterate through it again and again, you keep, you keep persistent in archiving your history, which gives you the ability to identify the interesting rules and patterns. You take those and deploy them into your real-time operations, and you make constant improvements and adjustments to it. Let me uh, walk you through a little animation real quick. So those, those are the initial pieces that we saw. We have our instrumented um, assets data sources. They generate um, input streams that we are putting in our archive in our history. We go and look at the history. We mine and design the new objective functions, rules, and patterns. And the ones that we feel comfortable with, given the history that we have acquired, we take them and deploy them into our event processing engine. There they sit, and as the data comes in, they process the data, and they spit out results uh, that can mean, hey, look at this piece of equipment. You're exceeding the, the, the boundaries of operation for it. And we also keep track of those results when doing that, which gives us the ability to go into the next iteration and refine our objective rules, patterns, um, and queries, and make adjustments to what we have in our real-time processing engine. So that's the, the powerful cycle, the powerful iteration that we see at work here. How do we enable it uh, through Microsoft Stream Insight? 
So this is a kind of 10,000 feet perspective overview over the uh, stream inside product that we're building. And the slide has two parts. The first part is somewhat smaller. It's the top part of the slide. And it covers the development experience that we are providing for stream inside. The second half, the lower, uh, the lower part of the slide, is the runtime experience. So thinking about the, uh, the development experience, um, Microsoft Stream Insight is heavily based on, uh, on .NET, and we are using Visual Studio 2008 um, to, to, to render the, the development experience for Stream Insight. So the way that you would write, uh, write a Stream Insight application is that you go into Visual Studio, you uh, include a couple of references to the Stream Insight DLLs, and then you start writing in C Sharp your application. The rules and patterns, the queries are expressed in link. And once you've written your application, once you've built your application, you run it, and we take those link expressions, and we submit them over into the runtime for Stream Insight. And that gets us into the second half of the slide. If you look into uh, the, the middle part, the, uh, the complex event processing engine that comes with Stream Insight, you see a couple of those standing queries um, in the runtime. Those standing queries are derived from the link expressions, the link queries that you, that you have put into your C Sharp application. And what they do is they sit in, these, in the Stream Insight engine and are constantly listening to the incoming data from the data sources on the left-hand side of the slide, and they're constantly computing the results for the data sinks on the right-hand side of the slide. So the overall data flow at runtime is from left to right through, through that picture. And there are a couple of interesting components that I want to mention along the way. So if you look at all these different event sources that I have here on the slide, they come from various different domains. So we want to enable you to, uh, to connect to your data sources for your domain, for your vertical, for your industry. The way that we do this is by providing an adapter SDK, a well-defined API that gives you the ability to write an adapter that connects to your data source, acquires the, the data in the domain-specific format, and translates it over into the canonical format that we need for processing in the Stream Insight engine. So once you've gone through the translation process in your adapter, you take the Stream Insight event and you enqueue it for processing in the Stream Insight engine. After you've enqueued the event, the Stream Insight engine takes care of all the remaining processing. So all, um, so all the, the processing is triggered automatically. All the queries that you have sitting in the Stream Insight engine are picking up those new events automatically. Um, a couple of characteristics for the processing that's happening there. We want to do as much of the processing in an incremental fashion. Why is that important? It is important because it helps us keep down the latency. Remember that we want to have very compelling latency uh, characteristics. And doing all the computations incrementally is very important to reach those latency characteristics. Um, another important uh, factor that I want to mention here is all the state management that uh, you have to do. For instance, if you want to look over periods of time, you may have to hold some state in memory. We are doing all that state management for you. You don't have to worry about it. The, uh, the architecture that we have put in place for Stream Insight is very composable, so you can put queries on top of queries. Also, operators are very composable. They receive data streams on the input side, and they generate data streams on the output side. So operators are composable, again, which is very powerful and gives you the ability to write very expressive queries. We'll get to that in a second. So once all the events have traveled to a query, they may result into an output that you want to generate. That output is sent into an output adapter, and the output adapter is very symmetric to the input adapter. It picks up a piece of data from the Stream Insight engine and translates it into whatever format the data sync is, is expecting. So let's look at a couple of the, the concepts that we touched on the previous slide. The first one is, what, what are those events? And uh, they, they typically have two properties. One is, what are the temporal characteristics of the event, and what's the payload of the event? When we started looking into the temporal characteristics, we saw three different classes. And the first one is very simple. You just have a point in time, and you want to annotate the events that you're generating with that, with that timestamp. The second one is a little bit more intricate because it turns out that the event is actually has a duration. It has a start time and an end time. And that duration is known up front. The, the third kind is a variation of that where the start time is known up front when you submit the event, but the end time is not yet known. What we want to make sure is with Stream Insight that we all su support all these three different flavors of events. So let's switch over to the, the second characteristic, the payload. Um, if you look into uh, various different event sources, some of them are very simple. They are time series data. Time series data just has a timestamp, a value, and maybe a couple of status indicators. 
they're fairly straightforward and simple in terms of the schema that they present for querying purposes. There are other event sources that have much richer schema. If you look, for instance, at the, uh, the Windows event viewer, uh, we have the screenshot here on the slide, you already see that it has multiple different fields, and all of them might be meaningful. If you render what I have in the event viewer here as a stream of events, it might be very meaningful to actually, uh, to actually show all the different fields, all the different columns that you have in the event viewer here. So that's an example of the rich payloads that we see with many scenarios. And we want to we wanna provide the capabilities, the functionality in Stream Insight that allows you to define event types that have these rich payloads. How do we do that? Um, remember that we're uh, we using .NET as the fundamentals for uh, doing all the processing and writing the applications. So we, we are using the .NET type system. We are basically taking all the, uh, the, the, the atomic .NET types and uh, we are allowing you to uh, build classes, structures in .NET that have those atomic types and those can then become um, event types for Stream Insight. In addition to that, Stream Insight, depending on the choices that you make, provisions all the temporal metadata around the, the, the .NET type, the .NET structure that you have put in place. So here on the slide is an example for a pump. It uh, brings along the timestamp, the temporal metadata, and then the rich payload that we were talking about previously, an ID for the pump, which is a long, and then type and location, which can be strings, and then two numeric fields, the capture, flow, and pressure. And this can be a very straightforward .NET class that you put in place, and once you've done that, you can register it as an event type with Stream Insight. Once you've defined your event type, what's the next step? Um, the event type describes the structure of an individual event, but what you are interested in is streams of events, sequences of events. So the next step that you take is that you define a stream of events of the type that you have put in place. And that stream basically has the capability to give you a potentially infinite sequence of events. And that sequence can be insertion of a new event that just arrived or changes to uh, the durations of existing events. Once you've put this uh, stream in place, there are a couple of interesting characteristics. Uh, first of all, the arrival rates can, can be very static, stable, steady, or they can fluctuate a lot. Another one that's even more intricate is um, what we call out-of-order arrival. And that's a very interesting property where the order of the timestamps of the events is different from the order in which the events arrive at the system. And that can have very, very intricate uh, processing uh, implications. What we've put in place in, in, in the foundations and the algebra of the Stream Insight engine is that it takes care of the out-of-order processing so that you don't have to worry about it, so you don't have to write code to, uh, to tackle those challenges. Once you've put the stream in place, you have defined that stream, the next step is that you point that stream to an adapter which identifies the data source. The adapter takes care of talking to the data source, acquiring the data items, and queuing them into the Stream Insight engine for processing. Once we've done that, so we have defined the type, we've defined the stream over the type, we have bound the stream to an adapter, then we can start writing queries over it. So what are the things that we want to do in those queries? And here's just a somewhat random list of requirements that we have seen that are consistent across the different industries and verticals. Well, we were already talking about the complex properties, the rich payloads that we want to support. Um, you also want to support calculations. Uh, you want to support grouping, partitioning, the typical aggregation operations, sum, min, max, count. And you want to do correlations across multiple data sources. Um, and uh, those, those are some of the, 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 the most prominent operations. Um, now, given those requirements, we want to surface that in a, in a way that makes it easy for you to write your applications and, and um, maintain them. So what are the features that we have put into the product to uh, cover those requirements? And you see uh, our background from relational database systems. A lot of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the operations that we have put into Stream Insight are very related to uh, algebra operations in the relational algebra. The first one carries over straightforward from the relational algebra. It's a simple project operation that allows you to do calculations. The next one is a join operation, which we also have in the relational algebra. Here it comes with a little twist. What the join operation does, if you join two data streams, what you want to make sure is that the events that you match from the two sites, that they also are closely related in time. Those are the additional semantics that we've put in place for the join operation for Stream Insight. We provide you uh, the ability to check for existence or non-existence um, in a data stream. 
Uh, we allow you to do filter operations uh, similar to or relational database systems. We have all the typical aggregation operations, min, max, average, count, and heavy hitters, checking for heavy hitters, and ranking top K. Um, in addition to that, given the domain that we are working in, and given the fact that most of the data sources are emitting timestamp or temporal properties, and so you want to make sure that we can do the processing for that information also in Stream Insight. And that led us to add additional operations that are typically not found in the relation algebra. And those are the windowing operations that I have here, hopping windows, sliding windows, tumbling windows. In addition to that, we also provide a very powerful operation that we call group and apply. It's somewhat related to the group by operation that you may know from SQL and relational database systems, but it goes beyond that. What it does, it, if you think about an incoming data stream, you can take a field in that incoming data stream, and based on that field, partition the incoming data stream into substreams, into partitions. And then for each such partition, you can apply an individual subquery to that partition to do some specific processing over that partition. After you have done the processing on all these substreams on these partitions, we union the results back together. And that can be a very powerful operation. So if you think about all the different pieces of equipment of the same type that you have in your plant, in your organization, you can feed all that information through one thick channel into a Stream Insight engine, apply the group and apply operation to it, break it out into, uh, into partitions, into subsets that are specific to each piece of equipment or asset that you're monitoring, and then do checking, do aggregation for each piece of equipment individually before unioning the results back together. Note that this operation is data-driven, so it's very dynamic. The number of partitions, the number of groups, depends on the different pieces of data that we are acquiring from the data stream below. And we are doing the state management for you. So we're dynamically allocating and deallocating these partitions, these groups, and the main memory state that they require. In addition to uh, those powerful operations, we also provide you an extensibility SDK that allows you to provide your own operations um, for stream inside processing. Let me uh, walk you real quick through a couple of examples to illustrate those concepts a little bit. Remember that we, were, uh, that we are rendering all the, 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 the query writing experience through a language integrated query in .NET. And the first example that I have here is a very straightforward one where I'm taking two input streams, my stream one and my stream two, and I want to join them based on their ID fields. That's the first operation here that I have. In addition to that, I want to do a filter operation over it where I check for the presence of a particular string in one of the fields. That's the filter operation. And based on that, I compose a new result event type that takes one field from the first stream and another field from the second stream. So very straightforward. Also for the folks who are uh, uh, familiar already with writing SQL, it's uh, very similar to uh, SQL syntactically. Let's look at a more complicated example, more intricate example, that is actually using the group and apply operation that I was just mentioning. So think about a, a data stream, my stream three, that has a field i, and based on the values that I see in field i, I wanna, I wanna generate, I wanna dynamically generate substreams. This is what the first two lines do in this example. For each such substream that I have generated, I wanna apply a hopping window operation. A hopping window is, if you think about time going from left to right, you, uh, you divide the, the, the time axis into, into chunks, and these chunks do not overlap. So that's the hopping window um, for five minutes here. If you, want to, if you want the windows to overlap, you can also define a hop size, which is the second parameter that I have here. The hop size is three seconds. The window size is five minutes. So you have this, this hopping window that hops every three seconds and covers a period of time of five minutes. What am I, am I gonna do in that window that I have just defined? What I'm doing here is I do a very simple aggregation operation. I'm taking the average for the field F that I have in my substream. So let's have a quick look at um, um, a real Stream Inside application. Let me switch over to my laptop and uh, show you a little project that I have here. What you see here is uh, a market monitor that we are gonna extend a little bit throughout uh, the rest of the session. The, the first thing that I wanna mention is how do I actually, uh, well you notice it's Visual Studio, so we are in the Visual Studio.net world. Um, how am I actually getting the Stream Inside capabilities into my project? 
The way that I do this is that I add references to a couple of DLLs that we provision through the Microsoft Stream Insight installer. Um, you just add the using clauses for these uh, different DLLs that you need. And the ones that I've added here is the main one, complex event processing, and then the one that gives you the link experience, and another one that gives you a, um, a similar way like the reactive framework to acquire data from data sources that expose a reactive framework, iObservable, iObserver. So let's look at um, the data stream that we are generating here. Um, the, uh, the data type for it, come on, there you go. The data type for it is a very simple one. Um, we're in the financial services world, so what we're acquiring is a feed of, um, of uh, ticker information, a stock feed. And the fields that the events have are an ID, an asset class, which gives you the information whether it's a stock or a derivative, then uh, the country uh, where the, 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 the ticker information is coming from, and then the market, the stock exchange. In addition to that, we are acquiring the typical information, the last, the, the bid, the ask, bid size, ask size, and the volume, and maybe some timestamp information. So a very straightforward event type that we've put in place. Now, with this definition here, we are actually uh, generating a, uh, an IORP server that gives us the ability to enumerate all the, the quotes that we are receiving, and then triggering the processing over it for, um, um, for Stream Insight. The way that we do this is taking that input that we have just defined, converting it over into a CEP stream, and over that CEP stream, we can then write a simple query like this one, where for every event that I'm receiving in the input, I'm checking whether the stock ticker symbol is Microsoft, and only if it is Microsoft, I'm gonna emit, I'm gonna emit a result. So let's do this, let's run this uh, real quick, and uh, the way that we are generating the output is I've just put a, an output adapter in place that dumps all the results to the console window. So let's run this real quick. And what we are generating on the input side are random stock quotes. When you see those random stock quotes fly through, and if you, if you look at the output, you see that all the output that we are generating is from Microsoft. So that seems to work. As a proof of concept, let's see uh, what happens if we remove that line here that checks for Microsoft and maybe let's say we are interested in IBM instead. Let's run this again. And hooray, yes, the stock quotes that we are getting are still random stock quotes, but now this time they are coming from IBM instead of Microsoft. Um, note the continuous notion of the processing here. So we have started the query. The data source is constantly generating the incoming, the incoming events. We are constantly checking the, the where clause, the filter predicate that we have put in place. And we are constantly emitting those results until you stop the query, until you take down the application. There doesn't seem to be any uh, uh, asterisk. Is that because you're going to select everything no matter what? Or is there a way to mark that select clause? There? So the question is um, about the asterisk for um, Probably uh, when you're familiar with SQL, you, you, you're using select star from table. Um, the, w the way that link works is uh, somewhat different. So this is, this, is, this is basically our input stream, our sequence of events. Each event goes into our variable E, okay. and we are outputting E when it satisfies the where clause. We are getting the whole E, we're getting, we're acquiring all fields within E, and the select clause just outputs the whole structure that sits behind E. Yep, E is a class, and the class is of this type, the quote event type that we have defined and looked at previously. Okay, let's switch back. So that was a very simple example about writing queries and writing applications. Let's have a look at uh, a couple of the, uh, the, the, the additional features th um, that are very important if you want to provide Stream Insight as a platform for event processing across various different domains. Um, so the, the different operators that we put in place and that are coming with Stream Insight out of the box are likely not going to cover all of the functional, f functionality that you need. Probably 80% is covered, but for the remaining 20% that's domain specific, you may have to build your own functionality. The way that we allow you to do that is by providing an ex extensibility SDK that gives you the ability to write your domain-specific ex extensions to include existing libraries that you have already built for your domain that do some calculations and processing for you. 
the way that we've structured the extensibility SDK is into three parts. User-defined functions, user-defined aggregates, and user-defined operators. User-defined functions are the simplest one. What they do is, if you write a user-defined function, it receives a single event as its input and does some processing, some calculation over it, and returns a scalar value. The second one is a user-defined aggregate. A user-defined aggregate takes a set of events as its input, does some processing over it, and returns a scalar value that it derived from that set of events. The third concept is a user-defined operator. It's the most general concept that we have put in place. It takes a set of events as its input and does some processing over it and generates an arbitrary set of events on its output side. All of these operators, functions, and aggregates are written in .NET, C Sharp typically, and you build them in, in, as .NET assemblies, and you deploy those .NET assemblies, and once you have deployed those .NET assemblies to stream inside, you can refer to them from your link queries. I'm gonna show you an example in, uh, in just a second. Um, there, is a, there are some differences uh, in, in the level of detail that you uh, wanna expose and, 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 and work with. There are some user-defined operations that have to reason about time. They tend to be a little bit more complicated, not much. If you, if you have operations that need temporal information, there is, a, there is a detailed level of the extensibility SDK that allows you to reason about time. If you don't need it, there's a higher level of, of, of abstraction that is simpler and abstracts from the intricacies of dealing with time. Let me show you a, a, an example real quick for a user-defined extension. Um, in this one, um, I want to write a time-weighted average function, uh, an aggregate, and the way that I can refer to this is very simple. Um, here the example is basically just taking an output stream, uh, generating an output stream from um, a window, which I define over my input as a tumbling window of, uh, of duration 10 seconds. Within that tumbling window, I want to compute a time-weighted average over some value that I'm getting from the events um, in uh, in the window, and that's the result of the aggregation, and my output stream is containing events of uh, that type that, that have that, that aggregation, that time-weighted average. So very simple, very straightforward to refer to a user-defined function from link. How do I write that user-defined function? Here is the whole implementation of the user-defined function. It fits onto a single slide. Um, this, what you see here, is the code that does the, the time-weighted average calculation for the example that we had on the previous slide. Don't wanna walk through all the details here, but I take too much time for an overview session. So, having mentioned all this, uh, we realize that a lot of the intellectual property um, is going to be in the queries that you put in place. So a lot of the smarts, how you run your business, how you run your operations, is gonna show up in some way or another in the queries that you put into the applications. How can we make sure that you can take those queries and apply them to as many cases as possible without going back into the development mode? So that was a, a key requirement that we wanted to enable. How do we do that? The way that we do that is that we distinguish between instances of queries and query templates. Um, the, the way that, that you can reuse queries is that you provision a query template once and you instantiate it as many times as you need it. So think about a piece of equipment or a certain type of assets. If you wanna monitor that piece of equipment, you write a query template once, and as many instances that you have of that asset, you instantiate additional instances of that query template that monitor the different instances of the asset. Let me walk you through an example for this. So here we have a stream inside engine. We have the data sources on the left-hand side and uh, the, uh, the queries and results on the right-hand side. You start out with one sensor. From the vendor of the sensor, you're getting an adapter. You deploy the adapter into the Stream Inside engine. You also have a query template that you have written once, and you want to use it for that data source. So you uh, take the query template, you instantiate it, and you bind it to uh, the data source, and you wire it up with a data sync on the right-hand side. Then you can start the query and do the processing. Now what happens if you uh, get a revision of that, uh, of that device, a new version of the device, you install it in, uh, in your plan, for instance. It comes with its own adapter. The type of data that it emits is the same as the previous version of the device. So um, what you wanna do is you wanna use the same query template over that new device without actually rewriting the query template. 
We allow you to do that by generating another instance of that query template, wiring it up with the data source and the data sync, and you are ready to start up the query and do the processing. So one interesting property that follows from that is that you can apply the same scheme to processing of persisted historical data. Assume that you are persisting um, the sensor readings in a relational database system into a table in SQL Server. When you write an adapter that produces the same type like the devices and sensors that we are looking at in for the adapter one and two, you can use the same query template over that data source. You uh, deploy the query, you generate an instance, you bind it to the adapter that generates the same type, you can start the query without going, um, without going back into development mode. That makes you very agile because you can take an existing query template and run it over um, historized data that is persisted in some place. And once you feel good, once you feel happy with the way that the query works, you take it and without going back into development, you can deploy it to your real-time operations. We are working with real-time data feeds. The way that we are enabling that internally is by making sure that the data that is, that is required and the types of data that are required by a query is communicated by the query. Same on the output side. The, uh, the, the, the type of results that the query produces um, is communicated by the query template to the outside world. And that gives us the ability to reason about the properties of adapters and queries. If the adapter delivers a type that satisfies the required type of, uh, of the query, we can match the two and uh, you can bind them and you can run the query over those adapters. Um, with this binding, we are already uh, going into a little bit in the deployment and administration space. Um, let's take a step back and look at the different deployment alternatives that we see for stream insight and complex event processing. And in a big picture, we are structuring that into three parts. The first part is very close to the data source. The typical things that are happening there is you're sitting on the device or very close to the device, and the, and the device may generate a very high data rate. One of the typical things that happen there is that you want to reduce the data rate and just pass on events that seem to be important, and you don't want to generate additional traffic for events that seem useless. So those are some of the, the things that happen close to the data source, close to the device. And having stream inside complex event processing capabilities close to the data source allows you to scale your overall system in a much better way. The second tier for processing is uh, the gray area that I have here on the slide, where you start reasoning about multiple data sources. You want to join or correlate multiple data streams that you acquire from different data sources. You uh, may also do some aggregation over time that you acquire events and do some, uh, some compression over it before you pass it on. The third level that we see is the red or orange level here, where you do all sorts of mining and analytics over data. And in many cases, we see a combination where you're using historized data from an archive or an historian, and you compare it to data that you're acquiring in real time, so much more complex operations. The, with Stream Insight, we want to provide the capabilities that allow you to cover all these three areas. And uh, you've seen already some of that in the, the demo that we were just looking at. If you remember, we, were, we, we, we are providing Stream Insight as a set of DLLs. Um, we were using those DLLs in the using class in, in the demo that we saw previously. That's a very lightweight fashion because you are basically hosting the Stream Insight engine in the process. And that's very well suited for the lower levels of the deployment topology that you see on this slide. Um, with the Stream Insight installer, we are also providing you a standalone process, uh, an instance that you can fire up. And that is more suited for the, the red area on this slide, where multiple applications share the same data um, in, in, in one dedicated instance. So let me, uh, let me take a quick look at the different programming models that, that we have put in place. Um, we, we distinguish between uh, what we call an implicit server, an explicit server, and the I observable model. If you uh, download our public beta, we just did a refresh for it a couple of days ago, together with uh, Microsoft SQL Server November CTP, you'll find these different, uh, three different uh, development models in our samples. The, and they just provide different levels of abstraction, different levels of control. So the implicit server is the first one here. Um, you are not exposed to the details of the complex event processing server, the adapters, and the binding. So that gives you a, um, a very easy to use um, experience, um, but it does not allow you for query template reuse. 
if you want to reuse the query, uh, a query template, then you have to go into what we call the explicit server model. You have full control over the stream inside server. You can do in process and out of process, and you can also reuse your query templates. Um, another um, development model that is very closely uh, related to the reactive framework that Eric Meyer and co are putting in place is uh, when you have, for instance, a mouse um, and you want to consume mouse clicks and mouse movements, it's uh, very natural to uh, make this an observable where you can subscribe for any events that the mouse is emitting. And uh, obviously, it's interesting also to feed these events into Stream Insight. So the third, um, the, the third development model that we, uh, that we support is uh, using the reactive framework interfaces, iObserver and iObservable. And it's very easy to use, um, but the data source has to implement the reactive framework, the iObserver, iObservable interfaces. Let's have a quick look at a more intricate example. And uh, we already started out in the previous demo with a financial services example. What I want to do is uh, expand on this uh, demo a little bit. And uh, what I want to put in place is the following architecture. We, uh, we have a data provider here in the blue box on the left-hand side that generates random stock quotes for Microsoft and IBM. We, uh, we want to feed this into a Stream Insight engine that basically runs a monster query. The monster query groups over all the dimension fields in, uh, in, the, in the data that we acquire and does some aggregation over all the facts, all the measures that we are receiving from, from our random stock quote data source. The result that we are basically uh, constantly computing and producing as part of this monster query is what you see down here. So we have asset class, ticker, region, country, uh, the exchange. All of those are the dimension fields. And then down here are the, the, the measures, the facts that we are aggregating. And just for simplicity right now, I'm just doing, uh, doing summations. So this is, uh, this is basically the state that we are acquiring and the view of the financial world that we're constantly keeping up to date in this first instance here of Stream Insight. Why is this useful? Um, if you look at, for instance, traders sitting at their trading desks, they may want to look at certain parts of this overall data structure that we are maintaining here. And what they do is they subscribe, for instance, here in the first example to, uh, to all the Microsoft trades at NASDAQ, and they are just interested into a volume. So what they're doing is they're acquiring a view of this, this bigger piece of data down here, and they're looking at that in their, in their trading monitor. And in addition to acquiring that view, they also want to subscribe to all subsequent changes. So in order to, to, to do that and implement that, we are firing up a second stream inside engine that sits here um, at the trader's desk, and it does the necessary filtering to narrow down the set of data items that the trader is looking at, and it may need to do some additional groupings and some additional aggregation based on the query that the trader has put in place. Um, that should be extensible in a way that additional traders can join the picture, like the second one that I have here, which is interested in everything that trades at NASDAQ and is monitoring bits and asks. And that, again, leads to another Stream Insight engine that implements a different query and does different filtering and different grouping. All of these, these, these second-level queries here feed off the initial query that runs in the first uh, Stream Insight engine and that does the monster query. So let's look at this real quick, how this looks like. I don't want to walk through all the code here, but give you some sense all this could look like. So the overall structure of the project that I've put in place is um, the market monitor, which is similar to the previous project. We have a random data, so, uh, we have a data source that generates random stock quotes. We are now then, um, in addition to generating all the data, we are putting a stream inside query in place that does the aggregation for us that we were just talking about. So if you look into, uh, into that, into that um, query, you uh, see that we are acquiring an input from this uh, random, data uh, random stock quote data source, we are defining a, a window operation over it, like this one here, where we, are basically, uh, where, where we are defining a window over time that spans from the beginning of the trading day. And for that window, then, we uh, want to group by the, uh, by the different dimension fields that we have from our data source. And the grouping that we do is over the asset class stock versus derivative over the tip ticker symbol, the region that the exchange is in, EMEA versus North America, countries, US, UK, and the actual stock exchange. Those are the fields that we are grouping over. For each group, for each uh, new event that we're receiving from the data source, we generate a snapshot um, that has all the events that are in the window, and then we are generating an output. 
Uh, we output, obviously, uh, all the grouping fields, all the grouping values. This is what you see here. And then, in addition to that, we are summing up over three uh, measures of the volume, the ask size, and the bit size. So that's the monster query that, that we are running. Um, in addition to that, we uh, have the, what, what, what I call the market monitor observer project, which is the project that implements the, uh, the queries that are running at the trading desk. And um, you see uh, similar concepts here. Um, let me scroll down. And what you see here is, um, is a query that takes the incoming data um, from the snapshot and then uh, calls a user-defined function that evaluates the various different predicates that the traders have put in place, like am I monitoring Microsoft stock or am I monitoring IBM stock? This is done through a user-defined function. And in addition to that, I have put an output adapter in place that uses Excel, so all the output is going to show up in an Excel spreadsheet, and we're going to see that the Excel spreadsheet actually allows us to, uh, to present dynamic data that is changing all the time. Um, in addition to that, I have a little workbench here. This is just a control station for me where, um, where, where I can control the, uh, the various different um, trading stations and uh, what they are running. So let's, uh, let's fire, the, fire up the project. Um, what you see here is the workbench. If you look down into, uh, into the bottom of the screen, you already see the, the stock quotes flying by. I just put this into uh, the console output window here in Visual Studio. So you see already that the monster query in the background is already processing data and generating output. So uh, let's think about a trader that goes in here and wants to uh, monitor Microsoft stock. And the, uh, the regions that he or she's interested in is uh, from NASDAQ in the US, in North America. So let's fire up my Excel output, and you see a spreadsheet here. You see the values come in with the timestamp information at the top of the, of the screen, and you see that they are live, so they are changing every year now and then as we are receiving the appropriate data from the data source. In addition to that, I also have put a, uh, a chart in place that feeds off these values that are, that are getting pushed into the Excel cells, and you also see how the trend lines are changing. The values are very close to each other. The reason for that is that I'm just using a, a random data generator, so that's expected that all the different lines are very close to each other. And what the lines show is basically the sum of the volume, the sum of the bit ask, and the sum of the bid for Microsoft. Now, let's think about another trader. The other trader is interested in IBM. So what can that other trader do? Well, it can fire up its own Excel spreadsheet, and you see that the values are somewhat different. You also see that they uh, get started right away with the proper values. That's, uh, that's because we are keeping the, 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 the market state, the market snapshot, in our output adapter of the monster query. So the trader can see the, the current state right away and subscribe to changes, and we are bringing those changes into, uh, into Microsoft Excel here. So very powerful because it's very dynamic because additional traders can come and join at any point in time. And you get all the power of Excel, obviously. So this Excel thing is, is your output adapter. Uh, what's your input adapter there? The, uh, so Excel is, as you mentioned, is the, uh, the output adapter. The input adapter is, is, is a very straightforward thing. Um, remember that I said it's a, it's a random data generator. Let me uh, make some room here on the screen. So here, I'm generating a random quote. Come on, let's go and look at this guy. Uh, and this is, this is the code that generates random stock quotes. So, so to write input and output adapters, what kind of prerequisites do you have to fulfill? Do you need to derive from something that you provide? Um, in order to write an input or output adapter, we provide an adapter SDK that has a well-defined um, API you, uh, you, you inherit from that, uh, from that interface. You implement the interface as part of your adapter. The most prominent methods in there are basically enqueuing new events into, into Microsoft Stream Insight. Um, we have different flavors. I encourage you to check out the samples. We have different flavors um, of adapters that give you more ease of use or more control over the schema and the data source. They are part of the samples. And we can, we can chat more about it offline as well. OK. Let me, uh, so this is still going on. It should be running fine. Let me switch back into uh, the presentation at this point and uh, go into a quick recap. 
So this is a, this is a slide that you uh, have already seen. We, uh, we are looking at Microsoft Stream Insight as Microsoft's platform to build event-driven applications. The development experience that we provide is, is uh, very, very much uh, uh, based on .NET. So you're using Visual Studio as a development environment. You're writing your applications in a .NET language such as, such as C Sharp. The queries and rules are written in Link. Um, the, uh, the event processing engine that comes with Microsoft Stream Insight is different from a typical database, uh, database um, uh, system. Most and foremost and most prominently, it provides you the capabilities to run standing queries, to do continuous query processing. Um, it, um, it's very composable. You can use queries as building blocks. Um, it does all the computations incrementally to, uh, to, to, to give you very compelling latency characteristics. To uh, connect to different data sources and data sinks, Microsoft Stream Insight provides you a very flexible adapter SDK that uh, allows you to cover the various different domains that uh, you need to deal with for your event sources and event targets. And last but not least, the, uh, the, the fundamentals that we've put in place for the Stream Insight engine allow you to, uh, to, 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 uh, to make very easy use of, um, of, of, of the engine. We are, we are doing all the heavy lifting for you when it comes, for instance, to state management or dealing with temporal characteristics challenges that of, uh, such as out of order arrival of your data. The key deployment scenarios um, that we see at a very high level for Stream Insight are these four. The first one is where you uh, provision a Stream Insight engine and that instance serves as the platform for multiple different stream inside applications. And the data, the, the metadata and the data streams that are traveling through that, um, through that stream inside engine might be shared across these applications. The second one is the one that we have seen in, uh, in the first demo that I showed where you are, uh, where you are ref referring to the Microsoft Stream Insight um, uh, DLLs and you are hosting them within your process, within your application, and you use Stream Insight to do uh, some sort of event processing in, within your application. The third scenario just takes that from in-process to an in-device scenario where um, in the future we want to enable devices um, that are running, for instance, Microsoft CE or Windows Embedded um, to, uh, to embed the, uh, the, the Stream Insight engine and do processing on the device. The fourth scenario is uh, actually somewhat different from the previous scenarios, but a very compelling one, and that's why I want to share it with you. Um, if you have a, a pipeline, an ETL pipeline, that connects your operational data store with a, a data warehouse, um, you typically have very high maintenance windows. So it may take you a day or so to consume the, the new data or maybe even a week. So that gives you some staleness in the, in, the, in, the, in the decision support that you can do in the BI that you can do. One interesting way to, uh, to address that, that problem and to cut down on the latency of your maintenance window is by injecting Stream Insight into that pipeline that connects your operational backend systems with your data warehouse. And as you are acquiring the data from your operational backend and you're feeding it into your staging area, if you're already passing it through a Stream Insight engine, you can already compute some of your key performance indicators without any latency. So a very powerful scenario that allows you to reason about what are the key properties, the key KPIs that you want to monitor, and you, you inject those into a Stream Insight engine that they're running as part of your, your ETL pipeline. Um, a quick look into uh, the future and, and the past. Where are we in terms of our product roadmap? We're focusing uh, right now on uh, the first two scenarios that, we, that I had on the previous slide. We want to provide a, a platform for custom development for custom applications, and we also want to provide a platform for partners and ISVs uh, with Stream Insight. We uh, announced the product at TechEd earlier this year. We released our first public beta in, uh, in August uh, uh, as, uh, as part of our SQL Server commu uh, community technology previews. We also started our TAP program in August. We are continuing down that path. Uh, we just a couple of days ago released uh, the next version of our public beta. The next drop is out there. And if you want to if you want to get access to the bits, just come uh, come to me, talk to me after the session. I can point you to uh, to the download area. Um, the TAP program continues, and we are uh, we are going to release Microsoft Stream Insight with the next version of SQL Server, SQL Server 2008 R2, in the first half of uh, 2010. So that's uh, all that I have for today. Um, we can go into questions and answers. Before we do that, I'd like to encourage you to fill out the, the feedback 
Um, for every feedback that we get, we're actually uh, donating a dollar to a charity organization. So uh, please go back to, uh, to the Microsoft Ticket site and fill in the evaluation forms. Thanks very much. For, for questions, we have mics spread out through, uh, through the room. Uh, it, it would be great if you could use those mics because then I don't have to repeat your question. Okay. Uh, first question, once uh, upon a time I had to do a, uh, a GPS processing system that received dumb GPS from a device that showed your latitude and longitude, and we had to compute a better GPS stream that included a weighted average and velocity and acceleration. If you're doing that, would that be a, uh, what, what kind of, what would that look like? Um, what you're describing right now looks like a user-defined aggregate where mm -hmm. you are acquiring a set of longitude, latitude, uh, latitude values. You're feeding that into a user-defined aggregate. And for, for every, let's say, 10 readings that you're getting from the GPS device, you're outputting the, the, the direction and the speed and, and, and velocity right, and okay, things like that. Supposing we want to produce a new stream. Yes, every you time we get one, so, kick out a better one. So yes, this is, this is a, a perfectly valid scenario. Remember that, that, uh, that the properties of the operators and the queries, they consume streams on the input side, and they produce streams on the output side. You are free to do whatever transformation you want in between the input side and the output side. And some of those transformations can be dealt with with the built-in operators that we provide. Others, like the one that you just described, are probably requiring some use of the extensibility SDK. And one interesting thing uh, that I'd encourage you to do, uh, actually on Tuesday, uh, we had a session um, over lunch where we were showing how to use the, the, the SQL Server spatial library in combination with, um, with Microsoft Stream Insight. The application that we were building is, is very closely related to a scenario that, you just were, that we were just describing. The demo that I showed was basically tracking the longitude and latitude information from the Microsoft shuttles and then checking whether a particular shuttle comes close to Microsoft Building 34 or 35. And uh, you might already find some of the functionality that you're looking for covered by the spatial library. And uh, again, similar to Microsoft Stream Insight, it does not require you to uh, install any other SQL Server uh, products. You can just download it. It's a separate MSI. You install it. And it's, it's the same story for Microsoft Stream Insight. Other questions? Yeah, in regards to your last scenario to use Stream Insight for ETL, processing. Uh -huh. Are there any plans to integrate that with integration services? Because this is what most people do, I guess. Yes, that's an ongoing discussion that we are having with the integration services team. It's, uh, it's, it, right now, it's too early to, uh, to share any specifics uh, with you, but we are hearing this a lot. So we are, we are thinking about this. And if you, if you have specific requirements that you see, then it would be great if you can chat a little bit more after this. That, that this would be just uh, kind of codeless. So you, you just put uh, a stream insight kind of package into it, just formulate yep. the link query within that pre-baked package, there like B DTS in, in former days, VBS or whatever, and then you are done, basically. Well, there, there are a couple of challenges about the experience. Do we want to do, do, do support continuous uh, DTS packages? Because that's, that's, that's one important notion, one important concept for, for stream insight. So that's, that's one of the struggles that we are facing. talk for event processing and I'm just curious when why would this how does it compete with BizTalk and you know uh, so excellent question um, BizTalk obviously is is, uh, is is very strong and required if you need to provide additional capabilities um, for for you, the events or messages that you process for instance if you if you want to have um, if you, if you want to have uh, delivery guarantees, for instance, then you probably want to use uh, BizTalk at some point because BizTalk persists the, uh, the messages into SQL Server. We do not necessarily impose any persistence on you. All the processing that we do is in main memory. And only depending on the adapters that you use, you may choose to add persistence into the picture or not. Now, in addition, in, in addition to these uh, guaranteed delivery uh, requirements, there, there are other areas where you're clearly looking at BizTalk. So for instance, if you're looking at orchestration and inter integration across your organization, then BizTalk deals with those scenarios much better than we do. Now, there are other areas where you're clearly looking at Stream Insight. So for instance, if the data rate uh, turns out to be very, very challenging, then Stream Insight is probably better suited to uh, deal with the first level of reducing the data rate than BizTalk. A typical scenario that we see there 
is that Stream Insight first takes care of that data rate challenge. It cuts down the data rate until it becomes comfortable to be handled with BizTalk. And then you, uh, as a result from the Stream Insight processing, you enqueue a message into BizTalk to trigger on the, the subsequent business process that you want to do. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a that's a very good example. For instance, you are checking whether you have a device malfunctioning. You're doing this in Stream Insight, and as a complex result event, you d you determine a situation where the device is malfunctioning, and you are enqueuing the ticket into uh, into into BizTalk. Um, another example that we see is, for instance, in the RFID space, where data rates can be very, very challenging. So imagine a truck drives into a warehouse. The truck has tons of products on it, and you have all sorts of RFID readers around the doors for your warehouse. When the truck drives through that door, you get a gazillion of different events and tons of duplicates. If you enqueue all those into BizTalk, you're really challenging BizTalk. Now, what you want to do is you want to use Stream Insight to deduplicate the incoming data stream and then actually enqueue the interesting business event into BizTalk that a particular product arrived in your warehouse. So will BizTalk have an adapter to um, this? Similar to, uh, to the, the, the previous question, that's an ongoing conversation that we're having at this point. And I can actually point you to a session that I think also was on Tuesday over lunch. Mark Sims um, had a chalk talk on uh, integrating Stream Insight into existing BizTalk. Um, and you might want to check out that session. I don't know how much of the material is available online because it was a chalk talk session. I can give you my card and I can point you to Mark if you need more information on the BizTalk stuff. Okay, thank you. Next how do question, you, please. How do you scale this out for performance and availability? How do you scale this out for performance and availability? So those are actually two questions. Um, how, do you, how do I scale it out for performance and what do I do about availability? Um, let, me, let me start with, uh, with the performance aspect first. And it's actually interesting, the, uh, the example that I mentioned where we were working with an internal team at Microsoft where they do clickstream processing, they're already using a scale-out topology to deal with their, their performance requirements. Um, for some applications, this is very straightforward because they partition naturally. If you think about our group and apply operation that we were just discussing, if, um, if you can take the group and apply operation, you are already generating partitions. If uh, you can take that group and apply operation and, and basically appoint specific partitions to spe specific nodes in your cluster, then you have an application that partitions trivially. Um, the way that we enable this right now requires you still to do a lot of, of work in the application. We are not, year, not yet there to uh, give you transparent scale out characteristics, even in that simple scenario. So you have to do some code work in your application to enable this. But for many of the applications, it should be fairly straightforward. In particular, when you're using the group and apply operation, you can hash partition over your ID space and just point different <coughs> hash values to different nodes in your cluster. So that's, that's one way to, uh, to deal with scale out. And um, there, there are others that are more intricate. You, have, pro you obviously have to think more if your application does not have this tr uh, trivial uh, uh, partitioning characteristic. Thinking about um, high availability, so, so one of the interesting uh, scenarios that we want to enable is if you are already persisting history for the events in, in a historian, an archive, or even SQL Server, um, if you are doing that, we want to give you the ability to replay that history instead of generating yet another log. So we want to uh, keep down on the persistence requirements. We don't want to introduce um, additional persistence just to, uh, to enable HA capabilities. And we have specific operators in our algebra that we call eventual consistency that allow you to, uh, when, when your system goes down and you fire it up again, to go and check out the, the history uh, that you've persisted in your archive and replay the important part of the archive so that your query can catch up and get back into the previous state that you had before the system went down. So if I just used MSMQ, for example, for, my, for eventual delivery, I could stick an adapter on the end of that and then it would play and I could deal with it? That, that would be another option. Um, you, you have to then think about when do I actually commit the DQ from MSMQ? Um, and depending on the, the calculations that you do in Stream Insight, that may require some thought. When you, because you may have a very complicated query that actually consumes events from multiple queues, from multiple MSMQ points. Now you see a result on the output side. What does that mean? What can I commit on the input side when I've seen a particular output result? So that may require some thought. But, but in terms of failing over nodes, there's nothing built in here. It, it's, there's no link into uh, app fabric caching or anything like that? At this point, no, no. Um, we basically, we, we have, the, the, the whole engine runs in main memory. 
If you pull the plug, the main memory state is gone, and the first thing that you would do is catch up on that state again, and that's where we are providing you these eventual consistency operations. Thanks. And that's, but, but it's an important area for us to think more about, and we are looking into the HA space and give you basically transparent failover characteristics um, in, in, in the next release. You can already do this today, and we see uh, a lot of customers doing it already, that they are basically running uh, a number of stream inside engines in parallel, typically two, that gives them the ability to, uh, to just to take one down to maintain it, and the other one keeps processing all that stuff. And you, once you're done maintaining that instance, uh, you bring it back up again, you wait for a while, and it will be caught up on the state after a while, and you have the two instances back up and running. So that's the, that's the, the simplest case to basically have a hot, hot standby. Okay. Thank you. You just answered my question. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll be uh, around for, um, for another m couple of minutes here, um, but let me make some room here on the stage for the next speaker. Thank you very much.